we're talking to Zarna Joshi, and uh, uh, I was uh, actually on Facebook, and uh, I think I was um, reading somebody's thread, and uh, they just uh, put your article in there as a comment, you know, and I thought, oh, what's this? You know, uh, Italians are white. You know, what, what are they talking about? You know, so then I had to look it up and it's on the medium. Can, can you tell people what the medium is? Yeah, it's uh, zanajoshi.medium.com. And uh, there's a bunch of articles that uh, uh, I've written and you can find everything there. Yeah. And so the medium itself, what is that? Uh, Medium is uh, a website run like, you know, it's like a really large website and uh, different people post uh, their uh, uh, essays, articles, uh, different things. Um, and there are some uh, big publishers there. And then there are people uh, like me who just post things that they care about and research. And, uh, you know, it's free to like, you know, uh, be part of it also. So, you know, if, if you're interested in posting things or if different people are interested in posting uh, longer things that you can't necessarily fit into a social media post, then uh, Medium is a pretty good place to put it. So uh, the reason that I was like really intrigued by this article mm -hmm. is that um, because of the Black Lives Matter, we're kind of revisiting, um, deconstructing the mythology of uh, uh, American history right now. And, uh, you know, I've always been kind of interested in that. And then I, you know, actually read Howard Zinn, <laughs> People's History of the United States back in the 90s. And uh, basically, you know, uh, totally destroyed everything that I ever been taught about US history. And a lot of people read that, and they're really depressed. You know, it's like how Zinn would talk about this, you know, it would just say, you know, gosh, you just blew my whole fantasy, you know, about the United States, the founding fathers and the great men theory of history and all that. Right. But then other people read it and uh, they were all encouraged. Oh, I see. This is really how social progress happened. People organized, you know, and people got out there and piecemeal been uh, making progress, you know, and that's actually how it's done. And I, I keep on running into this all the time because, you know, people are, you know, really down on the fact that Biden is president and, you know, like he is just another corporatist, right? And uh, so, like, they're upset because they didn't, because Bernie didn't win and they didn't really have a choice. But they think that actually social progress comes from great, the great men when it doesn't. Right. So it's good that, you know, we got rid of the wicked witch number one, but now we have to deal with the lesser wicked witch. Right. And people don't understand that. And they think that we're that uh, politicians are the ones that actually create change. Whereas um, even if Bernie had gotten elected, he couldn't do a thing without us, because anything that Bernie tries to do, He's going up against the power structure. He's going up against the pharmaceutical companies and the war machine and, and all that. Yes. I mean, I absolutely, you know, yeah, like that's, that is absolutely true. And, you know, also like people um, also don't acknowledge the fact that Bernie himself is an imperialist <laughs> and the military industrial complex runs everything. In an empire, the military industrial complex runs everything, and it is absolutely true for this country. So, you know, whoever happens to be in power is going to have to contend with the military industrial complex. And usually it is the people who are working for that complex who get into power. And Biden is one of those people. So, you know, change never comes through politicians. Change comes through the people, through the grassroots. And that's something that we all have to, you know, we all have to to remember and keep in mind because um there's a lot of celebrating right now but what people don't realize is that you know ultimately these systems in power haven't changed at all right and uh, uh, also uh, most people in the united states don't recognize that this is an empire yeah <laughs> which actually we're not going to overthrow the empire <laughs> anytime <laughs> soon you know uh, <laughs> unless uh we have a revolution so uh, you know, which brings me to the point of your article, you know, um, 
Italians are white. So um, can you explain a little bit about what you're trying to get at there? <laughs> yeah, there were um, three particular things that I wanted to talk about with regards to this article and why I wrote it. Um, so uh, the first thing is that um, uh, in this social justice uh, movement, we talk a lot about the last 500 years of uh, history because that's when this continent first started to be colonized and turned into this white supremacist empire. Um, and so that's the focus. And it makes sense for us to focus on that uh, on this continent because that's the history of this continent. However, um, to only focus on that without thinking about where these things came from prior to that means that we're actually going to miss a lot of really important things. And so that's something that I wanted to actually talk about was the actual length and breadth of history and where these tactics came from, where these colonizing tactics came from, where these supremacist ideas came from. And in order to talk about that, you have to talk about the Romans. And you have to trace it through the history to actually see where these ideas actually came from. So that was uh, one thing. The other thing is that uh, we act as if child abuse is not a system of oppression, <laughs> even though it definitely is. And um, that's also part of the problem in that right now, we, you know, we've got the far right who have made child abuse their issue um, and part of the reason why they've been able to do that is because we're not talking about it. And so it's important for us to actually recognize this is a system of oppression. Children are at risk. They have been at risk for a long time. And that if we do not understand that all of these things are actually connected, we're not going to be fully explaining the depth of the trauma that is happening. And then the third thing, which is really the thing that really prompted me to like write this article, is the fact that I kept seeing over and over again, people including Italians in the realm of, of like, pe like people of color, even though that is a historical and a distortion of the facts. And uh, it's also very dangerous when you're a person of color, when you're a brown person or a, you know, like someone who is not white and you're being told that um, uh, white people get to uh, include themselves in a marginalized space. Um, and that's very dangerous when we're talking about trying to get actual collective uh, 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 liberation from white supremacy, but we're supposed to include white supremacists into a uh, marginalized category. And that's a serious problem. And that was something that I wanted to actually confront and say, look, this is the history. This is the actual history of where all of this comes from. And if we don't recognize this history, we're going to make mistakes like this. And that's a very dangerous thing. So that's why I actually uh, wrote this article. And, you know, you, you can't write about... Uh, Italians, Italy, um, history without talking about child abuse, without talking about the history of uh, empire and colonization and tracing it through those 2000 years of history. So you're saying that, uh, you know, the Italians, um, you know, poor Italians were immigrants and they came to the United States and they were discriminated against and yeah. uh, they were still considered white. But yeah. Uh, that whole concept of white supremacy actually originated in Rome, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with skin color. No. Which uh, <laughs> is another thing that I have found out about recently because I had um, Bill Fletcher Jr. on here, who's a really famous uh, labor historian, and he was talking about uh, how that even my ancestors, which were the Irish, were not considered to be white by the British. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But they are white skinned, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, in Rome, yeah. you know, uh, if you weren't a Roman, then you weren't white because you were yeah. barbarian, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's like when we're talking about the Romans, it, you know, their ideas became what are modern day racist ideas, right? Like 
So it's not that they were practicing what we consider to be uh, racism today, but all of their ideas and the whole way that they operated became what is uh, this system. And, and so, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, Irish people, um, back in the day, they were not considered to be white because they weren't considered to be the dominant power, right? And the dominant power in uh, Europe at that time was the British and uh, specifically English and the French. And those were the people who had the most power in Europe at that time. So if you weren't one of those people, then you weren't important and you certainly weren't, you know, considered to be the purest of white because it's not that they were actually considered you know not white it's that they weren't considered pure white right and that's why you've got these invented hierarchies right so for example when uh when italians came to uh this country and specifically these are poor italians um you know they weren't considered white by the poor people here because the poor northern Europeans in this country had their ideas of what was, you know, the most powerful white at the time, which was British and French. And uh, Italians at that time were not considered to be very powerful, even though they were the ones who had created what is considered to be modern day Europe. <laughs> and uh, the fact that it was the Romans who actually, sorry? say that last part again to be so it was the romans who actually created you know what we really consider to be the european uh uh empire because it was the roman empire right so from britain all the way to turkey you know and like parts of uh northern africa as well like all of that was the roman empire and uh, they had their own ideas as to, you know, um, who within their empire was superior and who was not. So even though they didn't practice what we think of as like modern day uh, racism, they still said, you know, when they were buying slaves, they would say, well, where is this slave from? And they would want to know because they had thoughts about... Um, uh which particular people were good at which particular type of uh labor so if they wanted someone who was good at you know shepherding they might choose a uh gaul so someone from france or belgium if they wanted someone who was a, you know a uh, strong uh warrior they might choose a german uh if they wanted someone who uh was going to be a, a good sex slave, they might choose a Syrian or an uh, Egyptian because they had decided that these particular different people were good, and this is their idea of good, right, at certain tasks. And so this idea of different people from different areas are good at certain things is a Roman idea that they then utilize, and those ideas live later came to turn into what is modern day racism, where uh, people of Europe are supposed to be, you know, uh, good at certain things. They're supposed to be smarter. They're supposed to be good at building things. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, literate people, even though they actually weren't literate at all in so many ways. Um, you know, all of these things came from this Roman idea that by, you know, by finding out which region someone is from or which, uh, you know, or which language they speak or, you know, these ideas of their particular culture translated later on into race because later Europeans decided the skin color and culture and uh, uh, those things were now how you could define who was good at what. And if they were not good at this, then you were superior to them. And if you're superior to them, then you can control them, enslave them, pillage them, rape them, etc., etc. And the Romans had exactly the same thoughts. They just didn't call it racism. Yeah. 
And so the Gauls, you know, which were the French. And the were, French and the Belgians and like a little bit of like Southern Europe as well. But, you, but mostly like Western, Northern, like Europe area, that, that, that was the Gauls, yeah. A huge, huge part of Europe that the uh, mm -hmm. Romans conquered. And mm -hmm. uh, the same with the Brits, you know, they wanted to go to Britain to, you know, get the tin, but everywhere they went, they wanted to get cheap labor, which is kind of the yeah. same. What, what our empire does, or all mm -hmm. empires, right, and all colonial powers, yep. right? So the theory right. is, is the same. The Romans set the standard, but, you know, uh, then now the Northern Europeans and the French you know, were uh, looked down upon the Italians who actually were the ones that conquered them first. And, right. uh, you know, I found, you know, I actually learned a huge amount, you know, because I really don't know a whole lot about uh, ancient history, right? And, uh, you know, so looking at all your links, you know, like in, in your article and stuff like that, you could spend a whole week reading about this and uh you know i just learned uh all, all kinds of stuff you know that uh, uh thank you so much you know, i have to say you know because um uh, uh really gained a lot out of that but um caesar uh in just one campaign killed a million gauls yeah right? so you know the romans were really 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 nasty right and mm -hmm. course, you know we're, we're really nasty we probably wiped out a million people in iraq right yeah but um, they would le uh, wipe out entire cities, just kill yeah. everybody, right? And then yeah. enslave other ones. They would just enslave people, but they would rape everybody. Yep. You know, why, why, what was this big thing about raping people? You know, rape has, has been a weapon of war for a long time. And it, you know, it, it was only in the late 20th century that the UN finally said that rape was a weapon of war and called it a crime against humanity. And, and even then, it was only when they discovered that the uh, Bosnian, uh, that during the uh, Bosnian-Serbia war, you know, there were these like rape camps and white girls were being raped. And when they saw that, they said, oh my God, rape is a crime against humanity and it's a weapon of war. And it's like, well, this is, you know, white men have been doing this to black and brown women all over the world. And it's always been a weapon of war. And the Romans use this as a weapon of war. And, and so why? Um, and there's lots, of, there's lots of things that you can go and, uh, you know, uh, read. But it's a, first of all, it's a physical weapon because you can literally kill someone, right? You can literally kill someone or, or you can damage them so much that they are permanently disabled for life or they will never be able to have children ever again or you've now forced them to have your children which is a form of ethnic cleansing. It's also psychological torture, right? Even before they get here, you're terrified because you know that everyone's at risk. Everyone's going to get raped, right? So that fear in and of itself is a weapon, right? It's also psychological torture because how do you pick up and move on from that, right? If you're someone who's been raped, you're going to be someone who has to cope with the trauma of it right? If you are, you know, physically uh, able, you know, to like keep going on, you're going to have to go on, even if you don't want to. You may also have to go, go on with the child of your rapist, which is extremely tra like traumatizing. Also, if you happen to be married, uh, your partner may well never want to be with you ever again. Uh, they may beat you and blame you for it. Your own people may blame you for it. So it is in every way a genocide. Uh, native people on this continent called it the slow genocide because the white men, when they came to this continent, they did exactly the same thing to them where they raped them until they are almost not in existence anymore. They're 1% of the population and they're still here, right? And I just want to, you know, say that they are still here. They are still on this land. They are still fighting for their rights. But that's, you know, that is one of the traumas that they have to live with is this genocide, which was rape 
used as a weapon of war against them and continues to be used when we think about missing and murdered indigenous women that's still happening to this day. They are more likely to be missing and murdered than any other category of women except black women. And black women were, you know, also have this history uh, of being women who were enslaved, used as sex slaves and tortured and uh, locked up, put in chains, et cetera, et cetera, which is still happening to this day. It's happening in our modern prison complex and you know, it, it just continues to happen. So this tactic of rape being used as a weapon of war you know, continues to this day and the Romans used it extensively very effectively and they used it in Britain 2000 years ago when they first invaded and the British learned it so well that when they went out and colonized it was exactly the same tactic that they used. So the Romans invaded Britain mm -hmm. and uh, I want to kind of get into this uh, you know, idea of uh, indoctrination and religion, you know, uh, as a means of control. And mm -hmm. uh, so the Romans completely wiped out the Druids. And, you know, we all kind of think of the Druids as building Stonehenge and all that, but uh, I guess that's not true. It wasn't. The, 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 yeah. I mean, we don't know for sure. It, it, it seems as if it probably wasn't them because Stonehenge is so much earlier, but we also don't have any real facts as to how old uh, the Druids actually were. So, you know, as far as I know from what I've seen, there's no way of knowing, but it's possible that Stonehenge didn't come from them. Yeah, but um, the Druids were very, very, very important, you know, not just to the British, but to the Gauls. And uh, so there was a really good reasons why the Romans completely wiped them out. Maybe could yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, it's like when you look at the history and, and you see that the Druids were literally the native priesthood of Northern Europe or, you know, Western Northern Europe specifically. And you can see this when you see, uh, you know, similar cultural um, uh, similar cultural things uh, all over Britain and France and Germany and, you know, those places. So, for example, uh, if you've ever heard of the uh, uh, ley line system, uh, the ley line system is a system where uh, the native people believed that there were these lines of uh, energy that ran through the earth and they would put sacred things on these lines and when the lines crossed they would have sacred structures and so Stonehenge is on two uh 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 it's on two uh ley lines now this is actually all over northern Europe and so when we come to the Druids and we see that the Druid stronghold was in Anglesey which is in Wales but that there were actually Druid priesthoods all over uh, Northern Europe and, and that they had been there and that they would actually travel to Britain to study. So when the Romans came along and they wiped out the Druids and they wiped out their stronghold, what they were literally doing was wiping out indigenous spirituality, which was connected to the land and that sacredness and that connection to that land was then wiped out. And that's genocide. That is straight up genocide. Because that meant that those indigenous people were no longer able to connect to their land in those sacred ways, the way that they had previously. And so, you know, which is why you get like, you know, once the Romans came along and then they, you know, wiped out the Druids and then they said, you know, you all need to speak Latin now and you all need to follow what we tell you now. And uh, our laws are going to take precedence now. And, you know, and, and if you look at how the people in Britain interacted with each other and the Druids before, and then you look at it after you see that there's a clear disconnect where the, you know, the different tribes, 
uh, even if they didn't like each other, everyone welcomed the uh, Druids because the Druids were the priests for everyone. So the Druids connected everyone together. And once the Druids were wiped out, you've now got the different tribes who are no longer connected to each other in any type of spiritual way. And then you've got this uh, division within uh, Britain itself, where you've got the northern uh, British tribes who were cut off from the southern tribes because the Romans built a war. They built a war. <laughs> and empires do this. Whenever they get to a point where they think they can't fight these tribes, they put up a war and then they demonize those tribes. And everyone south of that war uh, has to believe it. And, and, and that, that division between England and Scotland still remains to this day when previously it had been the, the tribes not only talked to each other, but the Druids connected all of them so that there was this cohesion and native uh, unity that seems to be quite deep like deep rooted. And then the Romans came, they wiped that out. And from that point on, Britain was no longer this cohesive, united uh, indigenous culture. It was a colonized culture. And specifically the people who were colonized, um, you know, they were the ones who then di dictated what the people who were least colonized uh, how they were perceived, how people saw them. You know, when you think about the fact that Anglesey is in Wales and the English uh, also have this history of dominating Wales and the Welsh and the Scottish, were, you know, are considered to be less civilized than the English because the English were colonized, you know, by the Romans first and most and when those native people, you know, were fighting back, they were pushed further and further back uh, into Wales and Scotland. And it's still present to this day. You, you see the scars of that to this day. Yes. You know, and it's also that uh, the uh, Druids were a source of, you know, cohesion so that they could uh, create resistance yes. you know, between the tribes where, you know, that once they eliminated that, then there was that source wasn't there anymore yeah absolutely absolutely Be, you know because they they were the ones who were going from tribe to tribe uh explaining what was happening and that they needed to fight back against these colonizers and once that cohesion and that um uh information link was broken it then it uh it then becomes harder for the different peoples you know to like defend their land and each other. So that cohesion that the uh, Druids provided, and because they were very patriotic, the Druids were patriotic Britons, and they were the ones who were, you know, really pushing uh, these uh, different tribes to work together. And so, of course, it made perfect sense that the Romans were like, well, we need to get rid of this, you know, priesthood, uh, because they're the ones who are actually fomenting the resistance and also and 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 you know when uh when the white men came to uh this continent it's actually they actually did the same thing where they went and they found the spiritual elders and they wiped them out first yeah. they wiped them out first because those elders are going to be the ones teaching everyone else how to actually fight back so to stop that from happening white men when they came to this continent they did exactly the same thing to them and once they're gone you now have a very tenuous link to your uh native spirituality and you know like even then the people here have managed to you know like hold on to certain parts of their culture but that has been so hard for them and the fact that they still do is is a like heroic but b it's only been 500 years and you know when we, when we think about well britain it was 2000 years ago so we, there's literally been 2000 years of erosion after erosion after erosion every single century which is why it's so important 
on this continent for us to support indigenous peoples so that this you know doesn't continue happening to them and it's one of the things that you know i've continually stressed you know throughout years that you know i'm in solidarity with indigenous peoples here and all over the world and it also uh has to do with you know how the romans set the scene the stage for indoctrination you know uh, they first they go in and they wipe out the indigenous uh religions yeah. you know, and then they uh either absorb them into their religion you know uh you will be assimilated <laughs> Right. Uh, you know, that's, I think that the Star Trek, you know, the Borg are the Romans. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 It's, you know, when you, when you like, that's why it's so important to study history and particularly to study the Romans and their tactics. Because when you look at their tactics, these are the tactics that every empire after them used because they learned them from the Romans. So the, the, like, absolutely, it was systematic. First you go in, wipe out whatever is the native priesthood, right? So you wipe them out so that they can't teach anyone. Then you, you know, burn their scriptures, tear down their spiritual strongholds, tear down, you know, their temples or whatever. Um, and then you can set up, your own thing. Now, one thing that the Romans did, which was slightly different to how Christian supremacists, you know, like do things now, is that the Romans, before they became Christian, uh, they were pagans. And so the tactic that they used was they would take whatever was their spirituality and they would mash it together with whatever they, they thought was the most malleable native spirituality right so the druids weren't malleable so they wiped them out right but the other things that were malleable they would say oh yeah sure like yes uh uh you know uh like uh the native people have uh this goddess that's just like our goddess and actually it's the same goddess and look you know like we will build you a temple to that goddess right so they would do these things where they would try to convince the native people that they were actually the same and like we're just like you and so you should just put up with us ruling over you and the difference between that is that um when christianity became this you know the uh roman uh uh, uh state uh, religion and uh, method of control, um, they used Christianity to say nothing else can exist. Now, the nuance of that, and I go into this in detail, uh, is the fact that Christianity itself and Roman Christianity and Roman Catholicism is 100% the Roman tactic of taking their religion and mashing it with someone else's uh, spirituality but they called it a new thing. Like they said, this is, this is not anything else and we've got to get rid of everything else because only this can exist. So for example, you know, Christianity as the uh, uh, Romans did it was they said that Jesus, and Jesus is, you know, the God, the only God, because, you know, we're now talking about monotheism and he's the only God. And, um, and therefore this is the state of, uh, uh, this is the state religion and through the centuries that became more and more extreme and you know and they did this despite the fact that Jesus was a Jewish man like you know if he even existed right he was a, a Jewish man a uh, Middle Eastern Semitic person who was actively fighting against the Roman Empire so the Romans took something that was resistance and they twisted it so that it actually uh, helped them control the very people that they were trying to uh, uh, colonize and uh, pillage. And so you've got this evolution of like Roman behavior where, you know, genocide and then, you know, we'll mash your thing with our thing but then that turns into now only our thing 
is the thing that you can follow. And anything other than this is going to be totally destroyed. And now you've got Christian supremacy and Christian supremacy became white supremacy. So you've got white supremacy that became white supremacy. And really, when you look at it all, it's the same thing, just with different names and, you know, with different empires. But it's actually exactly the same thing if you really look at the tactics that they used and the thinking that was uh, coming from it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Christians will be very disappointed to realize that they're actually worshiping Zeus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's so much evidence. Like, it's, it's right there. You know, like, um, from what we know from sources, uh, you know, Jesus would have been about five to six feet tall, dark hair, uh, no beard, uh, short dark hair, no beard, and he would have been wearing uh, unbleached woolen uh, robes, um, very non-Roman looking. He would not have looked like a tall, muscular, flowing, long hair, flowing beard type of person, because really when you actually look at it, what you find out is that the Romans presented Jesus in the guise of Jupiter. Uh, you know, uh, who the Greeks called uh, Zeus. And, you know, when you look at um, uh, certain, it, like when you look at Spanish and you find out that their word for Jesus is Jesus, right? Like it, it's, it, it doesn't take a genius to actually find out that they simply translated Jesus into Jupiter or Zeus and their priesthood became the Christian priesthood and that that then became the dominant uh, religion, even though the pagans themselves uh, were then uh, oppressed and you know, suffered their own genocide by their own Roman state uh, because that was how they decided that they were going to control everyone. But that is actually what happened. The Christians, once they came into power, they committed a genocide of pagans all over Europe and then all over the world. Yeah, so the, uh, Constantinople uh, uh, made Christianity the state religion. And he wasn't a Christian himself. He just realized that it was a good tool for controlling mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so then the Roman Catholic Church actually was Rome. Yeah. But all this, uh, I actually did a, sh a show, you know, uh, years ago. Uh, so long ago, I can't remember, but you know, it was, it was all these people. This is an organization that was formed, you know, of all the people that had been molested by Catholic priests, right? And one of the things I found out from them is that this has been going on for a thousand years. But you're saying it went on for a lot longer than a thousand years. A lot longer. A lot longer. It comes from the Roman Empire. In Rome, uh, pedophilia was legal. Um, it was institutionalized. Um, there were certain people, not all, but there were certain people who actually used Jupiter um, and stories of uh, Jupiter abducting a uh, adolescent boy to be his eternal cupbearer companion, right? But, but, you know, really like, like meaning his child's sex slave, right? They used these stories to justify pedophilia. Now, that wouldn't be necessary unless there were people at the time saying raping children is wrong, <laughs> right? But that, but that was absolutely institutionalized. Like it was part of Roman culture. So, when they uh, appropriated Jesus and uh, Christianity and made that their state, uh, their state method of uh, control, they simply, you know, tran like translated their pedophile culture, you know, into this new religion. So when people talk about child abuse being this modern phenomenon and like oh my god like you know there's like a worldwide like epidemic of like christian priests raping children and it's like it, it, this is not a modern day phenomenon this is absolutely you know 
well, like over 2000 years old and it's been going on for this entire time. And the reason why we have this worldwide rape culture specifically, you know, that is pedophiliac is because of the Romans and then the Christians who then spread that everywhere they went in their missions with their missionaries. And the fact that like, even on this continent and we talk about the boarding school trauma that like, uh, uh, native people have on this continent and they talk about how the little children were taken away by the Jesuit priests by the Protestant priests and they were raped they were sexually tortured they were beaten and many of them didn't make it many of them died and when you go to these boarding schools you actually find that there's mass graves of children there because they were literally tortured to death by these so-called men of God um, and that, that, that was absolutely what Romans were doing then, and they're still doing it now. Um, and, and like, you know, I mean, I talk about this where I literally traced it through all of history where, oh yes, we see it here. Oh yes. Second century, third century, fourth century, you know, seventh century, eighth century, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century. And you see, even within the Christian bishops in the fourth century, they were complaining about the pedophilia within their ranks then, even then. And I mean, honestly, the fact that they were even, you know, talking about it is a good thing, but they didn't actually stop it. And they didn't like, uh, they didn't do anything to actually stop it that would have, you know, uh, made a, uh, 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 made a difference. And part of the reason for that is that they scapegoated homosexuality. And then they said, oh, this isn't about patriarchy and, uh, you know, raping children. This is about men wanting to have sex with other men. And because of that, of course, that's utter nonsense uh, that, you know, uh, gay people are to blame for this. In fact, gay people are most likely to be abused as children and targeted. So it, it, not only, like, is it a fallacy, we're literally blaming the victim, right? Uh, but that's what they did. And they literally did that through history. And I traced it. And I give people links. And I give people evidence. And I say, this is a quote from this person. This is a quote from this person. Like, it's right there in the record. This is not new. But the fact that it's not new doesn't make it okay. Like, that's why we have to work so hard to actually root this out. And, you know, like, talk about it and actually say, you know, this has to stop. And it's not going to stop if we like. Uh, it's not going to stop if we only talk about it as if it's this modern like phenomenon. We have to actually talk about its ancient roots and where it came from, and only then can we actually start to heal, because we can see okay, this is where the roots of it are. Now, how do we pull those roots out? <laughs> you know, and that's you know one of the like major reasons why I uh, wrote this article. Yeah, and they had a different system for women. The, uh, girls, because mm -hmm. the, thing is that, uh, mm -hmm. the girls, uh, they would just force them into marriage. And yeah. at the time they were like, uh, they would be virgins, you know, and then they would be forced into mm -hmm. marriage when they're 12, 13 years old to older men, mm -hmm. you know, so it was the same thing, yeah. but uh, yeah. it, it was a little bit different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, absolutely. That's absolutely what it was. Um, and, you know, I mean, the Romans borrowed uh, lots from the Greeks as well. And the Greeks were even more brutal. Um, and it's hard to believe that anyone could be more brutal than the Romans, but the Greeks absolutely were. And also the Greeks were also white, you know, just to be clear. Um, but yeah, like that, yeah, absolutely. The, 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 you know, the girls, the moment they first bled, really, like the moment they had their first period, really, they, they, they could and would be married off. Um, and, and, you know, within Roman law, uh, if rape happened, the victim was not the girl or the woman, the, the victim was her father or her husband. So for example, if a 14 year old girl was abducted and raped, uh, her, like, uh, her father got to, uh, demand compensation because, uh, because he had not consented to it. Meanwhile, was there any, you know, help or healing for the actual girl? No. No, there was none. And meanwhile, they were also, um, you know, that like that, like their sons 
uh, you know, they, they would give their sons to wealthy, prominent men to mentor, right? That's what they called it, mentoring. But everyone understood that this mentoring was literally a sexual relationship. And when I say sexual relationship, let's be clear, this is literally like rape, you know, pedophilia happening. Uh, but their boys were taught that this is how men behave and the um the actually this was a masculine thing and um you know like the misogyny inherent in that as well as the rape culture as well as the institutionalized pedophilia as well as these toxic ideas of what masculinity is is all wrapped up in that and you know which is why it's so important to understand intersectional justice right that simultaneous oppressions are happening at the same time and if we don't understand these simultaneous oppressions we're not going to understand how to actually pull it apart and get to the roots of the problem which is why i talk about all of these things uh in the article like you can't leave any of it out because it's all connected and the thing is that there's a class element in this too because if, <laughs> if uh uh, if you were a person of stature and yeah. someone raped your daughter, well, then, you know, that would be an offense against you. But yeah. if you were a slave or yeah. if you were a poor person, it, it wouldn't matter. You know, yes. anybody could rape you or your kid or whatever, you know? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you were a slave, you could get raped no matter what. And it was perfectly legal because you were property. You didn't get to consent. Yeah. You know, but if you were a citizen of Rome, then you had grounds to complain if your daughter was abducted. Mm -hmm. But only then, if you were not a citizen, you know, because it's like, even if you weren't a slave, if you weren't a citizen of Rome, no one was going to listen to you. So really, you had to be a citizen of Rome and specifically a rich citizen of Rome. And then someone would care you know, but only to the extent that uh, you had been paid for your daughter. And, and, and I mean, you know, also like this actually also goes into the idea of whether or not ordinary people uh, profit from uh, empire. And this is actually one of those cases where yes, yes, they do. They do. Yeah. Because um, if you are a citizen of that empire, you have power that people who are not a citizen of that empire have, right? You can complain about things and say, well, you can't do that to me because I've got rights, right? In a way that someone who's not a citizen of that empire can never say, because no one's ever going to listen to them. And, you know, like even within that, there are layers, right? Like there's, you know, layers of like, well, what's the poor peasant Roman going to say as opposed to the senator, right? Like obviously there's, you know, class even within that. But e even the poorest Roman peasant, if they were a Roman, they had more power than anyone who was not Roman uh, in that system. And that's just a fact. Uh, Rome, one of the reasons why people wanted to be Roman was because if you were a Roman citizen, they gave you food. You got fed. You got fed, right? Now, if we look at our empire and the fact that in this country we have abundance of food, right? Abundance of food. And meanwhile, other countries are starving, even though we are literally extracting their food and water for ourselves right now that is privilege we have in this empire even though within this empire we have starving people our own people are starving because we don't distribute like you know like we don't distribute it in a way that you know uh you know uh everyone's got access right and we've got food deserts we've got you know so many people who uh you know uh um the food that uh, the food that they eat is uh, extremely poor quality, except that even that food, why do they have uh, access to it? It's because our government subsidizes those corporations and those companies so that people in this country have access to that food, right? Other countries don't have that access, right? So even then, when you look at it, the, the privilege of the citizen of an empire 
exists. It absolutely exists and it is a class privilege. Um, even though within that empire, there is still uh, hierarchy, racism, uh, you know, uh, slavery. When we talk about our uh, uh, prison, uh, you know, system and the fact that that is neo-slavery and the fact that black and brown people are disproportionately locked up um, within that system and then forced to, you know, uh, 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 labor for corporations and for the state for cheap, extremely cheap, um, like almost no wages whatsoever. And the fact that that happens, like that's still happening 100%, that is true. Um, and even then you still see that there is a privilege that people in other countries don't have. Even like if you were to look at this election right now, right? Like in this election right now, people were protesting, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump and his white supremacist policies, uh, you know, kids in cages, um, you know, police brutality, you know, like all so many of these things, these were all things that came up. And these are things that we've been protesting anyway. But with Donald Trump in charge, it was just this like, you know, so many people were protesting so many of these things, except that we've been world police for decades. The U.S. has literally been the world police dropping bombs and, you know, uh, invading other countries for decades, literally decades. We've been in Afghanistan for 19 straight years now. But, you know, no one seems to think that, um, you know, maybe dropping bombs and literally invading their countries uh, is the same thing. Right. And that's a privilege we have in this country that when it happens to us or we start to see those things, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, when we start to see those things happening and particularly people with class privilege in this country, you know, white people for the first time in their lives being afraid of the cops without realizing that black and brown people have always been afraid of the cops and the fact that around the entire world, this country is the cop that goes around the whole world enforcing its will on everyone. And that's a, that's a privilege that people in this country have that people in other countries do not have. And that is still the same privilege that Romans had over other people who were not part of the Roman Empire. Yeah. And there are no good empires. None. All the, good, all the empires, they all do the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, yes, one, like, you know, any particular group enforcing and dominating their own will over any other particular group and doing so by taking their land and taking their uh, resources and taking their people and raping their people. And, you know, all of these things that happen within empire is, of course, 100 percent evil. Now, the difference is when we call things empire but we don't necessarily know the history of it right and and you know so it's like think you know saying oh that's the same thing and putting that word on it without actually knowing what the history of it was you know learning from those people about what it was that the you know went on uh you know it's important for us to distinguish and actually be very specific when we're talking about empire which is why I actually go through systematically all of the things that I'm talking about when I'm talking about the Roman Empire and when I'm talking about white supremacy. These specifically are all of the things that I'm doing because I'm being very specific that this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So um, there, we're kind of running out of time, but mm -hmm. there was one other thing. There was actually a couple other things I wanted to get to, but uh, one of them is the direct line <laughs> between ancient Rome and Mussolini, you know, mm -hmm. fascism and uh, German fascism, you know. <laughs> yep. That's just another example of the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, that, like, we get this word from Mussolini. We get the word fascism from Italians. And then they want to convince us that, you know, they're not white. Like, what? <laughs> like, like, people have never studied history clearly, and they've clearly never studied the 20th century. Like literally at the very same time that people in this country were saying, we don't like these Italians because they're not white. Mussolini was like invading Libya. 
you know, and uh, Ethiopia and Somalia, you know, and, and like trying to take power over black bodies because Italy and Italians are white and they are a white supremacist country and they have been a white supremacist country for 2,000 years. And they were cry trying to restore uh, Rome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mussolini's rhetoric was very much about uh, restoring the Roman Empire and restoring the glory of Rome and that, you know, the whole world needed to see the, you know, this glory of Rome restored because that would bring about order. Uh, you know, I mean, just the same rhetoric, like it was the, you know, it was exactly the same propaganda that the Roman Caesars used to use that like Rome is the light, Rome is order, Rome is civilization. We get the word civilization from them, from the Romans and the Greeks. That's their word, you know, which was then imposed upon every black and brown country all over the entire world by white supremacists going on from, you know, the uh, 16th century onwards, you know? So it's like this idea and these ideas were Roman and we literally paid for it with World War II. We literally paid for it with World War II. That comes from ancient Rome. The roots of it were in ancient Rome. And, uh, you know, people have not studied history. And so they forget about these really critical details. So I just wanted to read this one thing that you wrote here. It says... Uh, <clears throat> So many tactics and ideas of colonization, such as building walls, extracting resources, enslaving natives, destroying the environment, committing genocide, demonizing indigenous peoples, colonizing indigenous peoples, uh, saving indigenous people, using religion to control, cultural appropriation, institutional rape culture, institutional pedophilia, legalizing looting, infinite growth, wars for more wars, authoritarian governments, assimilation, whitewashing their own crimes, portraying themselves as victims, gaslighting real victims, and on and on. Uh, all these tactics came from the Italians and their Roman ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> That's uh, close to the end of the article, I believe. But that it sums it up. It literally sums like literally all of these tactics that we see and we recognize today as white supremacist tactics. They are Italian and Roman tactics. Okay, so uh, all right, thanks a lot. I'll, uh, Thank you so much. Information on here so people can read the article and uh, uh, thanks a lot for the education you've given me here. Thank you. Thank you so much.